Hello everybody and welcome back to World of Warships Legends. My name is Spartan Elite 43 and tonight we're bringing back a series that I started a long time ago. Um, the History of the Ships series. And this time, as you may have already guessed by the title, we're going to be talking about the USS Texas Battleship 35. So hopefully you guys are ready. We're going to have some good times. We're going to talk about some history. I love the history of the ships. Like, I, I legitimately do love researching this stuff and, and, like, learning about each ship's, like, service history and their, their lifespan and so on and so forth. And uh, it doesn't get much better in the American Navy than uh, USS Texas. Now, there are a lot of ships in the U.S. Navy that have uh, been well-known throughout history, but Texas is one of those that's still around today if you want to visit it. I mean, actually, it's currently in dry dock. I don't know if you can visit it right now, but I'm sure it'll come out of dry dock here in the near future. Well, within the next few years, anyway. And it'll be back as a museum ship. So, with that being said, let's get straight into it. USS Texas served in Mexican waters following the Tampico incident, but saw no action there. Uh, she was a New York-class battleship. She was launched on May 18, 1912 and commissioned on March 12, 1914. She made numerous sorties into the North Sea during World War I without engaging the enemy, though she did fire in anger for the first time when shooting medium-caliber guns at a supposed submarine. No evidence exists that suggests that these were anything more than waves. In World War II, Texas escorted war convoys across the Atlantic and later shelled the neutral French in the North African Campaign and German-held beaches in the Normandy landings before being transferred to the Pacific Theater late in 1944 to provide naval gunfire support during the battles of Iwo Jima and Okinawa. Texas was decommissioned in 1948, having earned a total of five battle stars for service in World War II. She is currently undergoing a $35 million repair project in Galveston, Galveston, Texas, and then headed to a yet unknown location for future tours. Texas was also a technological testbed, the first U.S. battleship to mount anti-aircraft guns, the first U.S. warship to control gunfire with directors and range keepers, the first U.S. battleship to launch an aircraft, and one of the first U.S. Navy warships to receive pro uh, production radar. Texas was the first U.S. battleship to become a permanent museum ship, though USS Oregon, which became a museum in 1925 through 1923, years before Texas, was intended to be permanent before World War II required her service, and eventual scrapping in the 1950s. The first, U the first battleship declared to be a U.S. National Historic Landmark and is the only remaining World War I-era dreadnought battleship. She is also one of the eight remaining ships and the only remaining capital ship to have survived in both world wars. Construction. The United States Congress authorized the construction of Texas, the second Navy ship to be named after the state, on the 24th of June, 1910. Bids for Texas were accepted from 27th of September to 1st of December with the winning bid of $5,830,000, excluding the price of armor and armament, submitted by the Newport News Shipbuilding. The contract was signed on the 17th of December and plans were delivered to the building yard seven days later. Texas's keel was laid down on the 17th of April, 1911 at Newport News, Virginia. She was launched on May 18, 1912, sponsored by Miss Claudia uh, Leone, or Lyon, I'm not sure. If I pronounce things wrong, I do apologize. Y'all know how it is by now. Daughter of Colonel Cecil Lyon, or Leone, Republican National Committeeman from Texas. The ship was commissioned on 12th of March, 1914, with Captain Albert W. Grant in command. Texas's main battery consisted of 10 14-inch guns, or 10 14-inch 45 caliber Mark I guns, which could fire 1,400-pound armor-piercing shells to a range of 13 miles. Her secondary battery consisted of 21 5-inch 51 caliber guns. She also mounted four 21-inch torpedo tubes, for the Bliss Levitt Mark 8 torpedo. 
we're going to go ahead and skip forward and go straight into World War II service because this is where she really uh, kind of made her name for herself, right? So let's go into it. So an early operation, soon after the war broke out in Europe in September of 1939, Texas began operating on the neutra uh, neutrality patrol, an American attempt to keep the war out of the Western Hemisphere. Hemisphere. Later, as the United States moved towards more active support of the Allied cause, the warship began con convoying ships carrying Lend-Lease material to the United Kingdom. In February of 1941, the U.S. 1st Marine Division was activated aboard Texas. On, Feb on the 1st of February, Admiral Ernest J. King hoisted his flag as, as Commander-in-Chief of the Reformed Atlantic Fleet aboard Texas. That same year, while on neutrality patrol in the Atlantic, Texas was stalked unsuccessfully by the German submarine U-203. On Sunday, the 7th of December, 1941, the, the day after the attack, or the day of the attack on Pearl Harbor, the battleship was at Casco Bay, Maine, undergoing a rest and relaxation period following three months of watch duty at Naval Station Argentina, New Newfoundland. Let me try that again. Undergoing a rest and relaxation period following three months of watch duty at Naval Station Argentia, Newfoundland. After 10 days at Casco Bay, she returned to Argentina and remained there until late January 1942, when she got underway to escort a convoy to England. After delivering her charges, the battleship patrolled waters near Iceland until March when she, was, when she returned home. At various times in 1942, the secondary battery was reduced to six 5-inch guns and the light AA battery was increased, adding two extra 1.1 inch 75 caliber quad mounts. These would be replaced by 10 quad mount 40 millimeter Bofors in June of 1943, and adding 14 20 millimeter Orlikan cannons, uh, increased to 44 by 1944. The attack on Pearl Harbor having demonstrated the need for this. For the next six months, she continued convoy escort missions to various destinations. On one occasion, she escorted Guadalcanal-bound Marines as far as Panama. On another, the warship screened service troops to Freetown, Sierra Leone, on the west coast of Africa. More frequently, she made voyages to and from the United Kingdom, escorting both cargo and troop-carrying ships. Operation Torch. On the 23rd of October, 1942, Texas embarked upon her first major combat operation when she sortied with Task Group 34.8, the Northern Attack Group for Operation Torch, the invasion of North Africa. The objective assigned to this group was Port Leote, I apologize, in French Morocco. The warships arrived off the assault beaches near the village of Medi Mehedia early in the morning of 8th of November and began preparations for the invasion. Texas transmitted Lieutenant General Dwight D. Eisenhower's first Voice of Freedom broadcast asking the French not to oppose Allied landings on North Africa. When the troops went ashore, Texas did not go into action immediately to support them. At that point in the war, the doctrine of amphibious warfare was still embryonic. Many army officers did not recognize the value of pre-landing bombardments. Instead, the army insisted upon attempting a landing by surprise. Texas entered the battle early in the afternoon when the army requested her to fire upon a Viking French army ammunition dump near Port Leyte. One more gunfire mission was provided on the 10th before the ceasefire on the 11th of November. Thus, unlike in later operations, she expended only 273 rounds of 14-inch shells and 6 rounds of 5-inch shells. During her short stay, some of her crewmen went ashore to assist in salvaging some of the ships and had their, that had been sunk in the harbor. On the 16th of November, Texas departed North Africa for the east coast of the United States in a task force along with Savannah, Sangamon, 
Kennebec, four transports, and seven destroyers. The young news reporter Walter Cronkite was on board Texas starting in Norfolk, uh, Norfolk, Virginia through her service off the coast of North Africa and thence back to the U.S. On the return trip, Cronkite was flown off Texas in one of her OS-2U Kingfisher aircraft when Norfolk was within flying distance. He was granted permission to be flown the rest of the distance to Norfolk so that he could outpace a rival correspondent on Massachusetts to return to the U.S. and to issue the first uncensored news reports to be published about Operation Torch. Cronkite's experiences aboard Texas launched his career as a war correspondent. Operation Overlord Throughout 1943, Texas carried out the familiar role of convoy escort with New York as her home port. She made numerous transatlantic voyages to such places as Casablanca and Gibraltar, as well as frequent visits to ports in the UK. The routine into 1942, that routine continued into 1942, but ended on the 22nd of April of that year, when at the European end of one such mission, she remained at Clyde Estuary in Scotland and began training for the invasion of Normandy. All right, we're going to go ahead and skip down to the D-Day. At 300, 0300 on the 6th of June, 1944, Texas and the British cruiser Glasgow entered the Omaha Western Fire Support Lane and arrived at her initial firing position 12,000 yards offshore near Point du Hoc, or Point du Hoc, at 0441 as part of the combined total U.S.-British flotilla of 702 ships, including seven battleships and five heavy cruisers. The initial bombardment commenced at 0550 against the sight of six 15-centimeter guns atop Point du Hoc, or Point du Hoc, I'm not sure which it is, when Texas ceased firing at the point at 0624. 255... Okay. So when Texas ceased firing at the point at 624, 255 14-inch shells had been fired in 34 minutes, an average rate of fire of 7.5 shells per minute, which was the longest sustained, fi- uh, sustained period of firing for Texas in World War II. While shells from the main guns were hitting point to hook, the 5-inch guns were firing on the area leading up to exit D1, the route to get inland from western Omaha. At 0626, Texas shifted her main battery gun fire to the western edge of Omaha Beach around the town of Veerfield. Meanwhile, her secondary battery went to work on another target on the western end of Omaha Beach, a ravine laced with strong points to defend an an exit road. Later, under control of airborne spotters, she moved her major caliber fire inland to interdict enemy reinforcement activities and to destroy batteries and other strong points further inland. I need intelligence data. By noon, the assault on Omaha Beach was in danger of collapsing due to stronger than imp- anticipated German resistance and the inability of the Allies to get needed armor and artillery units on the beach. In an effort to help the infantry fighting to take Omaha, some of the destroyers providing gunfire support closed closed near the shoreline, almost grounding themselves to fire on the Germans. Texas also closed to the shoreline at 1223. Texas closed to only 3,000 yards from the water's edge, firing her main guns with very little elevation to clear the western exit D1 in front of Veerville. Among other things, she fired upon snipers and machine gun nests hidden in a defile just off the beach. At the conclusion of that mission, the battleship attacked an enemy anti-aircraft battery located west of Veerful. On the 7th of June, the battleship received word that, a, that the Ranger Battalion at Point du Hoc was still isolated from the rest of the invasion force with low ammunition and mounting casualties. In response, Texas obtained and filled two LZVPs, which is landing craft. Um, So, if you guys didn't know that. 
So LZVPs are literally the, the boats that you see in the movies with the, the troops or the tanks and trucks, and that's what the LZVP is. It's a landing craft, okay? Anyway, uh, with provisions and ammunition for the Rangers, upon their return, the LZV, LCVPs, the landing crafts, brought the 35 wounded Rangers to Texas for treatment, of whom one died on the operating table. Along with the Rangers, a deceased Coast Guardsman and 27 prisoners, 20 Germies, Germans, 4 Italians, and 3 French, were brought to the ship. The prisoners were fed, segregated, and not formally interrogated abo aboard Texas due to the ship bombarding targets or standing by to bombard them. Before being loaded aboard an LST for transfer to England, Later in the day, her main battery rained shells on the enemy-held towns of Formigeny and Tre Treviers, I apologize, French, I do, to break up German troop con uh, concentrations. That evening, she bombarded a German mortar battery that had been shelling the beach. Not long, not long after midnight, German planes attacked the ships offshore and one of them swooped in low on Texas's starboard quarter. Her anti-aircraft batteries opened up immediately, but failed to hit the intruder. On the morning of 8th of June, her guns fired on Izzini. That's the best I got. Then on a shore battery, and finally on Trevieris once fault, more. Sir. After that, she retired to Plymouth to rearm, returning to the French coast on the 11th of June. From then until the 15th of June, she supported the army in its advance inland. By the 15th of June, the troops had advanced to the edge of Texas's gun range. Her last fire support mission was so far inland that to get the needed range, the starboard torpedo blister was flooded with water to provide a list of two degrees, which gave the guns enough elevation to complete the fire mission. With combat operations beyond the range of her guns on 16th of June, Texas left Normandy for England on 18th of June. For the Battle of Shoreburg, on the morning of the 25th of June, Texas, in company with Arkansas, Nevada, four cruisers, and 11 destroyers, closed in on the vital port of Cherbourg to suppress the fortifications and batteries surrounding the town while the U.S. Army's 7 Corps attacked the city from the rear. While en route to Cherbourg, the bombardment plan was changed and Task Group 129.2, built around Arkansas and Texas, was ordered to move six miles to the east of Sherburg and engaged the guns of Battery Hamburg, a large shore battery composed of four 24 centimeter guns. At 1208, Arkansas was the first to fire at the German positions while the German gunners waited for Arkansas and Texas to be well in range to return fire. At 1233, Texas was straddled by three German shells Fire, uh, five minutes later, Texas returned fire with a continuous stream of two-gun salvos. The battleship continued her, her firing runs in spite of shell geysers blossoming about her and difficulty spotting the targets because of smoke. I need support. However, the enemy gunners were just as stubborn and skilled. At 1316, a German 24-centimeter shell skidded across the top of her conning tower sheared the top of the fire control periscope off, hit the main support column of the navigation bridge, and exploded. The explosion caused the deck of the pilot house above to be blown upwards approximately four feet, wrecked the interior of the pilot house, and wounded seven. Of the 11 total casualties from the German shell hit, only one man succumbed to his wound. The helmsman on duty, Kristen Christensen, Texas commanding officer, Captain Baker, escaped unhurt but quick and quickly had the bridge cleared. The warship herself continued to deliver her 14-inch shells and two-gun salvos and, in spite of damage and casualties, scored a direct hit that penetrated one of the heavily reinforced gun emplacements to destroy the gun, at, or the gun inside at 1335. At 1447, an unexploded 24-centimeter shell was reported. The shell crashed through the port bow directly below the wardroom 
and entered the, the stateroom of Warrant Officer M.A. Clark, but failed to explode. The unexploded shell was later disarmed by a Navy bomb disposal officer in Portsmouth and is currently dispa displayed aboard the ship. Throughout the three-hour duel, the Germans straddled and near-missed Texas over 65 times. But she continued her mission firing 206 14-inch shells at Battery Hamburg until ordered to retire at 1501. Operation Dragoon. After Texas underwent repairs at Plymouth from damage sustained at Cherbourg, she drilled in preparation for the invasion of southern France. On the 16th of July, she departed Belfast Loft and headed for the Mediterranean. After stops at Gibraltar and Oran, Algeria, the battleship arrived in Taranto, Italy on 27th of July. Departing Taranto on the 11th of August, Texas rendezvoused with three French destroyers off uh, Bizerte, Tunisia, the ship is on fire. and set a course for the French Riviera. She arrived off of Saint Tropez, or yeah, it'd be Saint Tropez. I apologize. Again, y'all know I'm not doing this on purpose. During the night of the 14th of August and was joined early the next morning by Battleship Nevada and Cruiser Philadelphia. At 044... Yeah. At 0444 on the 15th of August, she moved into position for the pre-landing bombardment and at 0651 opened up on her first target, a battery of five 15 centimeter guns. The beaches had been fortified and heavy resistance was expected. Due to very poor visibility that morning, Texas relied on her SG radar equipment to determine her position and track for both navigation and gunnery purposes. No landmarks were visible during the firing and for the greater part of the forenoon. The heavy opposition that was expected never materialized, so the landing forces moved inland rapidly. As fire support from Texas's gun was no longer required, she departed the southern coast of France on the early morning of the 17th of August. After a stop at Palerno, or Palermo, Sicily, she left the Mediterranean and headed for New York, where she arrived on the 14th of September, 1944. Operations Detachment and Iceberg. At New York, Texas underwent a 36-day repair, er, repair period during which the barrels on her main battery were replaced. After a brief refresher cruise, she departed Maine in November and set a, cru a course via the Panama Canal for the Pacific. She made a stop at Long Beach, California, and then continued to Oaha. Oahu. Good Lord. I don't know what happened to my, my brain there. She spent Christmas at Pearl Harbor and then conducted maneuvers in the Hawaiian Inland Islands for about a month, at the end of which she steamed to Ulithi Atoll. She departed Ulithi on the 10th of February, 1945, stopped in the Mariana Islands for two days of invasion rehearsals, and then she set a course for Iwo Jima. She arrived off of Iwo Jima on the 16th of February, three days before the amphibious landings began. She spent just three days pounding the Japanese defenses on Iwo Jima in preparation for the landing of three Marine Corps divisions. After the Marines stormed the beaches on the 19th of February, Texas switched to providing naval gunfire support for them. On-call fire in response to requests from Marine units conduct, or continued through the 21st of February. Though the island of Iwo Jima was not declared to be captured until the 16th of March, Texas departed from the Volcano Islands on the 7th of March and returned to Ulithi Atoll to prepare for the invasion of Okinawa, Operation Iceberg. She departed from Ulithi with Task Force 54, the gunfire support unit, on 21st of March and arrived in the Ryukyu, Ryukyu Islands on the 26th. Texas moved in close to Okinawa and began her pre-landing bombardment the same day. For the next six days, she fired multiple salvos from her main guns to prepare, for the, prepare the way for several Army and Marine divisions to make their amphibious landings on the 1st of April. Each evening, Texas retired from her bombardment position close to Okinawa, but returned the next morning to reserve, 
to resume her bombardment. The enemy ashore preparing for a defense in depth strategy as, as at Iwo Jima made no answer. Only air units provided a response as several kamikaze raids were sent to harass the bombardment group. Tex Texas escaped damage during the, those attacks. On the 1st of April, after six days of aerial and naval bombardment, the ground troops went ashore and for almost two months, Texas remained in Okinawan waters, providing gunfire support for the troops and fending off the enemy aerial assault. In performing the latter mission, she claimed one kamikaze kill on her own and claimed three assists. On 14th of May, she departed Okinawa for the Philippines. Into the war. On the 17th of May, Texas arrived at Leyte in the Philippines and remained there until the Japanese capitulation on the 15th of August. She returned to Okinawa toward the end of August and stayed in the Ryukyu Islands until the 23rd of September. On that day, she set a course for the United States with homeward bound troops embarked as a part of Operation Magic Carpet. The battleship delivered her passengers to San Pedro, California on the 15th of October and celebrated Navy Day there on the 27th of October before resuming her mission to bring American troops home. She made two round trip voyages between California and Owo oh, God, why can I not say this? Oahu. I know the name. Can't say it in a, in a sentence. It's driving me crazy. In November and a third in late December. On the 21st of January 1946, Texas departed San Pedro and steamed via the Panama Canal to Norfolk, where she arrived on the 13th of February and soon began preparations for inactivation. On the 18th of June, she was placed officially in reserve at Baltimore, Maryland. And from there, she becomes the museum ship. One of the first true museum, the first true museum ship um, for the American battleships, anyway. Um, and we already talked about that a little bit. And from there, the rest is history. You guys can go see her uh, as a museum ship, I'm sure, once she gets out of dry, dry dock. But I hope you guys have enjoyed this. I know it's a long video. I know it's a lot of a lot of information. I really do hope that you guys enjoy these, these and uh, enjoy the pictures that I, I put in there as well for you guys to see at different periods of the, the war and, and so on. Because it really does bring these ships that we play in the game to life. You know what I'm saying? Now, obviously, we had some good, good gameplay in there for you too, and I hope you guys enjoyed that. But I really do hope that you guys enjoyed the... Um, the actual history behind the ship and getting to see you know the not just the ship in game but learning more about the ships in real life and if you like what i'm doing punch the like button leave a comment below subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and as always i will see you in the next video the next video for the history of series will be the history of the war spite. So hopefully you guys are ready for that. One of the most famous battleships in all of history. So let me know what you guys think. And I'll see you in the next one.